Finance and Economic Planning, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu. Good to have you join us, Doc. Well, thank you very much. All right, uh, let's uh, start it uh, straight away. You, as Finance Minister under the Abacha regime many years ago, you introduced value-added tax before uh, the Federal Executive Council. What made it economically expedient for you to introduce that policy at that time? Well, I, I think we should go back to the origins of what you might call uh, the social contract between the citizens and their government. Uh, uh, going back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century, uh, a French philosopher, you know, citizens give up something to their governors, to their rulers, in exchange for benefits. So the, the issue of the kinds of things they give up is a dynamic one and continues to change over time. So you diversify revenue base as the economy is growing. You widen the, the range in terms of bringing in more products and services to a particular uh, tax form. And also you can deepen it by also changing the rates. So these are things that have been going on for years in an effort to make sure that, and that's where the emphasis is on, that the governance pays attention to the needs of those governed. It's a social contract. They have responsibility to respond to what is given away by the citizens by bringing back the services. I hope you are still hearing me. Yes, I am. Go ahead, Doc. Now, you are hearing. I can just go ahead, right? Mm. At times, it fades on my screen here. Oh, so sorry about so that. Go ahead. this is mm. why the idea that was something very mo much more profound than the fact that as a minister, it's your responsibility to see how you can diversify revenue, just as we talk about diversifying the economy. And uh, I had had an uh, experience about about a decade before in Korea, where I worked as a World Bank economist, and I was uh, uh, responsible, along with a few others, uh, in introducing the value-added tax in Korea. Of course, it's a big tax form there now, along with other things. Mm. Of course, Korea has since advanced, not only in agricultural development, but particularly in industrial development. And with each advance, of course, the tax forms are continually changing. So that is the reason for it. There was no other, uh, particularly Nigerian, angle to this. All right. Uh, Dr. Kalu, how did Nigerians, or how did uh, council, on one hand, at that time, and Nigerians uh, receive this uh, tax regime which you introduced? Well, you know, like uh, even the most advanced societies, people are always skeptical. Even when they understand the 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 parts of this uh, contract, this social contract between the government and its people. People are always, people want to keep their money. People don't want to pay tax. In fact, uh, people are clamoring for benefits. They couldn't really give much of a hoot how you fund those benefits. So it's just the usual thing. A few people understood. Of course, one confided with all of them. And in fact, some seminar work had started on this, but it was during my time that it was finalized and we pushed it. And I, mean, I did make the joke that in the course of pushing it so hard, I, I felt some uh, discomfort. And I think the joke arose that I was trying to con my colleagues into accepting it by pretending that I was really under pressure, that I wasn't, which was just a joke anyway. Uh, that also tells you the sort of camaraderie we had uh, even at that time under a military government. It was all uh, a joke. And uh, I did come back in from being treated briefly. And we went ahead and passed the value added tax. Of course, we had so many other issues. Uh, in hindsight, I would say that perhaps we could have spent more time uh, discussing how this would be shared, uh, who would be collecting. But, you know, this was a, a unitary government, of course, by excellence. This was a military government. So I think that was really why uh, we sort of got away with not paying so much attention as to how you collect and how you distribute, because this was a unitary government, this was a military government. In the same way, mm. it is absolutely appropriate that the issue is coming up. But as somebody was saying, I was listening to your discussion earlier, this doesn't have to create such a row 
although mm. that has become our uh, blueprint these days. Mm. People just need to uh, get a, sh a fair representation of all stakeholders. All right, seven, so eight, ten people, mm. maybe twelve who have the expertise, who have the historical background to this, and who are tuned to the interests of all Nigerians from all corners of the country. And this should be quietly discussed, and uh, all the new issues emerging, how many years after, taken into account, and then we, we, we resolve something that then goes back to council mm. for debate and final resolution. It shouldn't be hitting headlines for more than a, a day or two, actually. All right, uh, Dr. Kalo, you alluded to the fact that uh, you were a part of a team that introduced uh, the VAT regime in South Korea. And uh, from what we can see, it has been largely successful in that country. Would you say the VAT regime which you introduced in this country has been successful as well? Well, I think uh, despite our uh, technical difficulties, this Despite our shortcomings with a uh, question of information and uh, wherewithal with infrastructure for uh, assessing, collecting, and so on and so forth, I think it's been quite successful. Uh, in fact, you could say from the standpoint of the consumer, it's been so successful, we kept it at 5%. Um, a few years ago, I headed this uh, Niger Delta technical uh, study, and I, I, in the report, I had suggested, in fact, that we raise it to 7.5% after regretting the fact that we had kept it for so long at five, when it could easily have been growing pari passu with the growth of uh, government revenues, growth of the economy, and the rest of it. Uh, well, that report was never really taken up. The idea was, of course, to, to agree, for, to recommend to government to agree that we raise it. I, my reaction was because I said, my goodness, since all these years, it has stayed at 5%. Certainly what we could do was to raise it to 7.5% and agree that we dedicate that 2.5% solely to address the issues of the Niger Delta at that mm -hmm. time. But somehow or the other, the report never got there. All we discussed thereafter was the amnesty program and the rest of it. Of course, uh, I was part of that program because it started while I was still abroad. So I just came back and joined the team, uh, mm -hmm. which was under... Uh, uh, met to, you know, uh, at that time. So um, that we should have really done something about it. So mm. uh, in answer to your question again, I think it has been, on the whole, very, very successful. We, 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 we didn't need to emphasize this thing we emphasize these mm. days about uh, just uh, uh, sharing it, but we are talking about how it could be grown, if you like, how it could be grown by expanding the base of the tax to cover other commodities as those commodities became more and more significant. Like we now came to cover the whole of the arts and the, and the media and other, you know, uh, things that have now uh, risen quite considerably in relative terms to the other more concrete sources of revenue. Uh, we, we also will have considered also adjusting the rate to create more avenues for government to respond to those social contract needs, to provide housing, uh, health, education, rural roads, support for farmers, support for the infirm, all manner of safety nets, those things that really make us a more humane society. This, this, this is the whole purpose of introducing a tax of this sort. So everybody is a small tax and everybody pays it in some form. Of course, in that sense, you can argue that uh, it, it has more burden on the higher classes because everybody pays the same rate. You don't go disaggregating the rates by by level of uh, the service or commodity uh, being paid for. But if you leave it low enough, incidentally, I know at the time the Ghanaians came to see me and uh, they were quite intrigued by what we were doing. But out of sheer enthusiasm, they decided to raise their to to start with 15%. And of course, those of you who remember, they, they had a few tax riots in, in Ghana, and I think they quickly rolled back. I don't quite remember how far back they rolled it, but they adjusted it because to start at 15, <laughs> it's like three mm. times our own rate was a little bit too much because the Ghanaians will be aware that we were doing it at 5%. All right, Dr. Kalu, you introduced VATs in a country structured as a federal state. Why was the process of collection centralized 
in a country with several federating units? Well, as I explained, uh, in hindsight, we didn't spend a whole lot of time discussing the board. Naturally, as I said earlier, this was a unitary administration. This was a military government. I'm sure under a civilian government, issues will have been raised like I've been raised now. By the same uh, uh, tone, I think we should not be arguing so much about it. Uh, the executive should set up a committee, look at all the issues. Where are the uh, VAT uh, uh, revenues coming from? A lot of them come from the huge federal establishment. Some of them are the ports, both airports and airports, and, all, and also big conglomerates, which of course are, have been cited where it's considered the, the most appropriate by those who started all these establishments. Now, with hindsight, you can just review and then, but a very important part of this, of course, is you are also looking at uh, the entity, the government entity that was most likely to have the resources to set up the extensive infrastructure that you will need to collect efficiently. But now that we have, uh, we've had our state structure for a while, it is clear that uh, most states, in fact, you can even take it further down, will be able to determine the infrastructure they need and people will be trained to do it. So it's not just to talk about collecting it, it's to make sure that the collection remains efficient and, um, and effective in terms of covering the entire base for which it is uh, being levied. All right, uh, Doc, uh, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended appears to be silent on who should collect facts. Perhaps that's why we are having this controversy that has led to uh, litigations. In your view, uh, Dr. Kalu, whose responsibility it is to collect VAT in view of current realities? Well, you know, if you look at the schedules, um, uh, various, the, the big ones, of course, you know, royalties have been assigned to federal and the income tax is collected by the states and so on and so forth. So, you know, um, there's nothing sacrosanct about who does. But again, I think it is very important for us to emphasize at this juncture that it's a shame that we are discussing who should collect. There's also the issue of uh, who should get the, what is collected. There are two distinct stages. Um, and as I said, we should be emphasizing the, the growth of this source of revenue. If the economy were going uh, growing at the rate one had envisaged. You know, in those days, some of us used to come around in Nigeria, and uh, it was expected that Nigeria was going to be another Korea. In fact, a lot of my colleagues always looked at me with some kind of uh, envy. Say, so, well, you know, your country is going to be the next one. We're talking about the mid 70s and so on. Now, if we had been growing at seven, eight, ten percent, or even higher, as we achieved in in some, in some form. In fact, even before the oil revenues, we were achieving such growth from just extensive farming, cocoa, palm oil, uh, cotton, and the rest of the, uh, some of the minerals that we had during those, before the oil came on board. If we were growing at appropriate rate, this would be a normal discussion because people are, by and large, receiving revenue. But of course, what has caused the current dispute is because uh, revenues are shrinking, the economy has not been growing, uh, income growth has not kept up with the pace of population growth, and there's a measure of uh, Dr. Kalu uh, Idika Kalu former Nigeria's uh, Minister of Finance and National Planning. They're joining me to look at the VAT uh, controversy. Interestingly, he introduced that policy uh, when he was Minister of Finance and National Planning before the council, then led by the late General Sani Abacha. And he has been explaining uh, to us why he introduced that policy and how the VAT uh, policy has fed over the years. Thank you. All right, let me have you. Uh, I'll be with you. All right, let me have you uh, land on your uh, last uh, thoughts on who should uh, be responsible for the collection of VAT in Nigeria: the state government or yes, the central I said, government? Yes, as I said, you know, we have uh, dealt with the question that 
the question of who collects, mm. there wasn't much emphasis because we were dealing with a unitary government, mm. not just a unitary government, but a military government. So the military administration, that General Abacha, of course, was saddled with that decision. It's not that, unlike most other military things, Nigeria's is not really the absolute military thing. There are a lot of civilians, the experts and so on. Um, once we, we managed to move it, after it was said that maybe I conned them by pretending I was having chest pain so they would pass it quickly, I really sort of faded out a little bit because there are other issues. We had all these issues on the exchange rate and so on, which we are yet to resolve, even up to now, as you can mm. see. So uh, one was preoccupied with so many other issues. So the nitty gritty of who collects and the rest of it was left to the uh, to, to, to the office of the head of service and the others, and a committee that, of course, included the various ministries and so on and so forth. Um, so, as I said, and uh, given an interview on mm. this earlier, I, I think the most ef efficacious approach is to set up a small team, not make it such a, an issue. We have enough issues in our hands as it is. Mm. Not make it such a big issue. Set up a small team of experts who have experience, who have the technical knowledge, and who are familiar with the composition, the level, and the sources of the VAT that we've been collecting. And a decision can be reached very quickly. In, uh, I think mm -hmm. if they start for four or five sessions within two weeks, they should be able to resolve that. So I think, um, you know, this this is what I, I don't want to prejudge mm. who should collect it. As I said earlier, those who may be clamoring for states to do it. First, they have to have the paraphernalia so they do it efficiently. Two, uh, depending on where the location of some of the main contributors are, some of these states may not get what they expect. So, uh, you know, it, it all depends. And this is why you need to have a, a fresh, objective assessment of the situation as it is, and then we can come up quickly with a decision. All right, Dr. Kalu, uh, perhaps you should uh, help us uh, explain uh, the parameters used in the distribution of VAT oh. revenues uh, among the various tiers of government. Dr. Kalu, can you hear me? Oh, could you just a minute, my system, just a, go ahead, I, I'm not seeing you, but, but could you, you repeat your question? Yes, uh, Dr. Kalu, can you hear me? I can hear you, All but right. I can't see you now. All right. That's okay. Yes, I was asking you to help us explain the parameters used in the distribution of VAT revenues among the various uh, tiers of government. Um, I asked this question against the backdrop of uh, recent concerns raised by the governor of River State, uh, uh, Chief Barrister Yeson Wike, who said in June uh, this year, River State generated VAT revenue uh, up to 15.2 billion naira. Uh, and of course, uh, was uh, given 4.7 billion naira, whereas uh, the FIRS uh, gave Kano 2.8 billion naira um, in a situation where Kano states uh, also generated 2.8 billion naira uh, in that same um, month. On paper, this doesn't look equitable, Dr. Kalu. Yes, I agree with you. The first principle of taxation in the, uh, the contract social as propounded by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it is the people who are paying the tax who should be enjoying the benefits. That, that is the case. But, um, well, it depends on how you now define that constituency. You might say that, well, if Nigerians pay VAT, it should not be used to, to, uh, to pay for services elsewhere. But then when you come to the constituency, how you divide it up? Because money is very fungible. So you are actually, in a philosophical sense, having to go back to your, your whole revenue distribution. You know, the whole distribution, whether it's a VAT or, or royalties or other taxes that have a, a, a wide collection. And that, as I said, is why at this juncture, the best is for a fresh look and we can do that very quickly. But by and large, to answer your question, where most of the taxes are levied, it, is, it stands to reason that they should be benefiting more. Mm. In fact, there's a, a way it can go down to the local government. Now, if, if you do that, like we talk about a Lagos state or River state or Kano state, by the time you go down to the local government level, some of those who are not in the areas where these establishments are located, 
may complain that they contribute so much and they get so little. So it doesn't stop there. The question of equity has to be applied in a commonsensical way to reflect the fact that where the burden is highest, that is where the benefits should be maximum in relation to other places. That's all I will say. All right, Dr. Kalu, uh, at the time you introduced uh, this uh, VAT policy, uh, what proposals did you make in terms of uh, distribution of revenues acc accruing from VAT among the uh, various tiers of government? Well, you know, this is how many? This is uh, what, 27 years ago or more? Mm -hmm. So I, I would think you better check the, the statute. I, I can't recall all the things that were signed off here, but the statutes will show you what was decided then. Mm. But after 20 years, this is two decades, obviously that may require a review. Um, you know, for instance, uh, during the Niger Delta thing, part of the economic policy one suggested was also reviewing how we allocate uh, oil wells, that it was ridiculous for us to be allocating oil wells to individuals. Now you see this a, a, a much heavier aberration than the distribution of VAT. Why should you allocate oil wells to individuals? On what basis? So it is not an isolated issue, but it's one of the issues that require uh, a review, particularly after two decades of applying the formula that was decided at that time. All right, All right Dr. Kalu, um, uh, you know, reports we are having uh, seem to suggest that about six states uh, of the Federal Republic of Nigeria are responsible for uh, about 80% of VAT collected in uh, Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Kalu, are there states in this country yes. considered too infertile uh, to generate sufficient VAT revenue? Well, can you see me? I can't see you anymore. I, I hope you can see me. Yes, uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? You, you can, you can see, you can hear me, but you can't see me. Yes, uh, but uh, we have your, uh, we have your picture uh, on the screen at the moment. Mm. Mm. So, okay, so Nigeria well, can still as see I you. Said, yeah. Let's make a distinction between collection and usage. Mm. I think you are, we are really talking about benefits, collection and benefits. The collection obviously has to be with the relative distribution of the base for the collection of these taxes. No, if you Dr. Kalu, I, I, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at the at capacity the to you generate. Mm. VAT can be collected where those services, goods and services are being, where those transactions are taking place. That may not necessarily be the spread of the population, the spread of even within a city, even within a state or local government. So, as I said, after two decades, it's only proper that rather than uh, the uh, equivocation as to what was set up in the statutes 20, uh, what, 27 years ago, this is a time to now take a quick review and ensure that there is equity, not so much in the collection. You can't do much about the collection. But the collection depends on where those establishments that are liable to pay VAT are located. You understand what I'm saying? Mm where the big hotels are, where the tourist centers are, and so on and so forth. But then there's a distinct phase beyond that where you now determine how best to allocate the revenues. The same way we collect revenues and have a distributable pool, and so much goes to federal government, so much goes to, go to the states. These are things that should be a very dynamic thing, which people are quite... Uh, uh, it's quite proper for them to ask questions. Constituent, uh, constituencies in the Federation should always raise questions where they have any doubt as to the dynamism in adjusting this uh, to reflect uh, equity in a dynamic way as population shifts, as centers of uh, uh, population grow, and so on and so forth. As the population disperses, even out of the city to rural areas, you need to continue to look at all this distribution, which is quite different from collection. The collection of course, depends on the base for which these uh, distinct uh, taxes are levied. Tax, import duties, uh, excise duties, mm. and the rest of it. So I think we should make that, have that distinction in mind and not get wedded to uh, uh, contaminous relationship between collection and uh, distribution or usage. Those are two different issues. Well, I was trying to find out, uh, Doug, if uh, there are... You know, there are states in the country considered that too weak to generate VAT. And what these states can do 
uh, your, to boost your voice, the fast your revenue. Your voice is very cracked. I don't know what's happening to the system. But go ahead. I'm hearing you. All right. Doc, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. I said I was asking if uh, you I'm think... I'm hearing you. Yes. I was asking if you think there are states in Nigeria too weak uh, to generate sufficient uh, VAT revenue. And what uh, is your proposal uh, for these states to begin uh, to boost uh, VAT revenue uh, and, of course, match with their counterparts such as Rivers, uh, Lagos, and, you know, other viable states? Well, you know, we are looking at VAT, so we are talking about... Uh, the states that con contribute the most. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it requires a study. There are minerals, for instance. Can you imagine, if we look at uh, minerals, mm -hmm. a lot has been said about uh, minerals being exploited no longer in just like tin mines as they used to be. Now we're talking about Zamfara and so many other states in the north that are justifiably exploiting these things, whether by local citizens or foreign companies and so on and so forth. Well, as I said, money is fungible. It's the same revenue from all these areas. So why you focus on states that may not be yielding much VAT? There are other revenues that may be coming out of those states. So this is really the juncture I think we need to, to use this opportunity to reappraise the various sources of the uh, revenues, tax revenues that we are uh, raising and make sure that we do not shortchange Nigerians because ultimately, ultimately, it is service to individuals, to citizens, regardless of their income, regardless of their expertise, regardless of the resources they have under their soil. How we are using the revenues generated in this nation to provide what we've uh, we used to call, uh, the term is, seems to be going out of use just when we need it the most. We call them basic needs, the basic needs housing, power, water, transportation, access of all sorts, jobs, and so on. So when you collect revenues, you have to make sure that in spending the revenues that you create that equity. So we should not crack our heads too much as to what do we do about those who are not collecting so much mm. fund. Ideally, if we are growing at five, seven, eight or more percentage points, as we ought to, given our tremendous resource endowment across this country, not just a... Uh, uh, minerals, but also agricultural products, uh, the revenues will be at such a minimal level that is high enough to give everybody some of these benefits. So the whole uh, disputation about VAT will totally have a different dimension. So I don't think we need to be sanguine uh, as to how we rule on those who collect, who, who contribute to VAT and those who don't contribute. We should look at the entire revenue structure and decide particularly for areas that have not received services. Mm. Areas complain that are lacking in federal establishments, schools, hospitals, and other establishments. This is a time for a federation. Whichever way we want to disaggregate towards a confederation by creating more states or by creating more powerful local governments that can uh, take care of most basic development needs, uh, which I suggest, rather mm. than all these other things, we should be reviewing that situation and come up with across-the-board decision based on what has happened over these last um, 27 years since, we, since VAT was introduced. Right, uh, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, former Nigeria's Minister of Finance and National Planning, speaking on the VAT controversy. Dr. Kalu, uh, just hang on. Uh, let's go on a quick commercial break. When we return, we'll continue our conversation with the former finance minister. Okay. To stay. Heartburn and indigestion? Try Just Eat. My recommendation for the past 26 years, Just Eat. Reliable remedy for heartburn, indigestion, flatulence, and acidity. Guys, we can't leave. We've got to finish the client's order tonight. This time? How about some top tea to cheer us up? Only one bag of top tea makes two strong cups, so taste to no more flavor, enjoyment, Great. friendship, and upliftment. Wow, this looks gorgeous. <laughs> Beautiful. Taste to know. Top tea.
give your kids winning energy. Milo Active Go. With the goodness of malt, milk and cocoa. Helps them make the most of every day. Milo. The energy to go further. All right, sir. Uh, you're still watching Kakaki, the African voice on Africa Independent Television, AIT. I still have uh, with me on our virtual platform, Dr. Kalu Idika uh, Kalu, former Nigeria's Minister of Finance and National uh, Planning. Good to know you're still there, Dr. Kalu. I'm still here, All although right. this is a, a tough thing. Uh, we're sorry Again, about that, uh, but I'm, I'm sure. Mm. All right, uh, Dr. Kalu, this, uh, you know, back and forth, hue and cry over who should collect VAT in Nigeria has thrown up, you know, the f a fresh debate on the issue of restructuring and the need for Nigeria to practice fiscal federalism. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you stand on this debate? Uh, hello? Yes, can you hear me, Doc? Okay, please repeat that again. I said the issue of uh, VAT, uh, the controversy that uh, this whole VAT issue has generated has thrown up a fresh debate on uh, the most talked about issue of restructuring and the need for Nigeria to practice fiscal federalism. Uh, yes. Well, yeah, what's yes, your take that's on this? Mm. That's a good thing. I mean, it's good that we have having to revisit the issue of the important issue of restructuring because of this VAT. Mm. Uh -huh. Go ahead. What's your question then? Yes, I said, what do you what's your what's what do you make of this uh, debate or this call for Nigeria to practice fiscal federalism? How is it going oh. to benefit the country? What do I make of the of yeah, the quest for restructuring? Exactly. Well, I I feel very strongly. I feel very strongly about it. I think between now and 2023, with the requisite goodwill, there's enough time for us to restructure before we now bounce into another federal elections. We should not be papering over the cracks that are widening every day by talking about um, not restructuring. As I said, it is the right of Nigerians. If enough Nigerians, a significant number of Nigerians, a strong constituency of Nigerians feels that we need to restructure, then we need to sit down and address it squarely. Uh, you ask my opinion. I mm. think um, what we really need to do, we have to ask ourselves first, are we agreed to evolve into a modern nation state? We have to answer that question first. If we say we agree, then we consider the most efficient way to evolve into a modern industrial state. And my suggestion is that we should create local governments. Everybody belongs to a local government. Not what we have here that has been killed by gerrymandering, ethnic, uh, uh, regional, and other uh, mundane issues. We should be looking at developing units. And I think if we have maybe half of the number of local governments we have now, where every member of that local government, whoever resides there, whichever part they come from, by the constitution should have equal rights. So all these indigenization issues, all these areas of origin will, will vanish. 50 years from now, our grandchildren will, 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 will just be the same as they are in other countries where you have a, a federal or confederal structure where people come from every area. Of course, they are still in the ethnic group. They are still practicing their religion and their cultures and language and songs and dance. But when it comes to civic responsibilities, you have equal local governments in terms of uh, population, more or less. Of course, they cannot be exactly equal. Certainly, they cannot be exactly equal in size either. But we should kill this issue of division if we really agree that we want to be an, a modern industrial state. The sooner we face that issue, the better. I've been conversing this for decades now, but People are not listening because they always go back to say, oh, they mm. don't get along. We can't get along. We we'll mm. do this, we we'll do that. Well, many countries have to take that decision. 
And uh, it is only fair to think of the future rather than just the present or the past in taking that decision. So I believe that um, the issue about the VAT mm. you know, f goes nicely into the issue of what kind of structure do we have? I know that people are clamoring to go back to the former regions, but I don't think it's really fair. That's my opinion now. Because a lot of the major ethnic, we should stop pretending like we are a tripod. We are not a tripod. There are many other major groups. And in any case, every other ethnic nationality deserves a say. It is not just what the tripod says it is. So the sooner we realize that. So let's give power further down to the lo grassroots, local governments, make them in a way that they are viable by reducing the vast number from 740-something to about 350 thereabouts, so that for virtually every project, they can carry out these projects. Mm. They have enough revenue base. They can leverage on federal muscle to do those that they cannot afford to do. And then we structure the fiscal situation accordingly. In fact, this will give us a much more disaggregated fiscal federal structure. So I think that we have enough time if the goodwill is there. And I think we should, mm. we should stop burying our head in the sand and just continue to, you know, just galloping on to the next election without settling this issue. So I subscribe to the view that with the goodwill, if the will is there, we have enough time, six months at the most, mm. to, to dispense with all the glaring inequities that are causing us so much headache, restructure appropriately, create a situation where Nigerians can live in a more perfect union, where you can move around as Nigerians do. All right. In, in, in any case, that's what they normally do. I think if you go to all parts of the country, mm. you see people from other parts. The fact that it's not equally applicable to every group doesn't mean that you now bifurcate it and make people start packing up and leaving and going somewhere else. But this is on the proviso that we've accepted mm. that we will be a modern industrial state. That decision is has to be taken quite deliberately. And then everything else follows from there. All right, so Dr. Kalu, uh, being a former Minister of Finance and National Planning, uh, I just can't let you go without uh, getting your input on the state of the Nigerian economy. Uh, currently, the debt profile of the country on, on, the states, on the state of the Nigerian economy. Yes. Can you hear me, Doc? Yes. Yes. I said I can't let you go without getting your input on the state of the Nigerian economy. Uh, as you know, the country's debt profile yes. is... Uh, fast rising and the government keeps borrowing. Are these borrowings sustainable? Well, um, you see, as I said in a recent interview also, um, you can discuss it at various levels. You can hardly discuss borrowing in absolute terms. Of course, there's a way you can gauge when the borrowing is heavy, whether in relation to your current income or your GDP or your export revenue and so on and so forth. But generally, borrowing should be only looked at in a in specific sense of the benefits that will accrue from the expenditure of the funds that you borrow. As long as those expenditures will yield a higher stream of incomes beyond what you pay and the interest costs and the rest of it, you should borrow until the two begin to die, begin to uh, converge, and maybe dive before they diverge. In other words, before you start having a higher cost of a payment for your borrowing than the revenues you derive from it. So it is in that sense. But I think most people really agree that we seem to have been borrowing in a very heavy fashion, mm. and uh, just uh, uh, culturally, it doesn't look like we are putting a lot of emphasis into evaluating the benefits that will accrue from the borrowing. That's why people are, 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 are worried. Whether we are borrowing externally or locally is the same thing. We borrow externally to make sure that the import com content of the investment is covered by borrowing rather than dipping into your limited foreign exchange. But you have to evaluate the benefits from borrowing before you undertake the borrowing. It's never exact, but at least you allow for some, for some uh, um, gaps there in the estimation. But as I said, this can get very uh, uh, technical. But the general notion is that if you borrow and you can pay back and you are making money, 
you should continue to borrow to expand your enterprise as a, as a firm, as a nation, to exploit your resources, including developing your manpower, developing education, social sectors, and so on. If you see that your people are held there mm. by borrowing to expand health services and so on, by all means, you do so, even though you cannot readily calculate the, uh, the benefits as you calculate from borrowing to set up a flour mill or any, any other commodity where you can see the commodity and the price and the revenue uh, in relation to the cost and the interest of that borrowing. So that is the context of which should be done. And this should be debated at every level, right up to the executive uh, council. All right, uh, Dr. Kalu Idika Kalu, former Nigeria's Minister of Finance and National Planning, a man who was privileged to have served in two military regimes, the Ibrahim Babangida military regime, and of course, that of the late Sunny Abaja. I want to appreciate your time on Kakaki, the African Voice this morning, Dr. Kalu. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Thanks for checking out Symphony on YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe and like our videos for updates.